Welcome back, everyone. Um, next up, we have Gabriel Gonzalez. Uh, Gabriel leads uh, Haskell at Nick's team at Awake Security. He has a blog at haskellforall.com. I'll link that in the Twitch chat. And his current project of interest is a programmable configuration language named DAO. Um, Gabriel is going to talk to us about marketing Haskell to a mainstream programmer. Take it away, Gabriel. Thank you. One second. All right. Oops, sorry. Uh, before I begin, I would like to quickly thank the organizers of this conference for making this all possible. And I'm always grateful for having the opportunity to meet and also to speak. And today I'm going to be talking about how to market Haskell to mainstream programmers. The inspiration from this talk is a book called Crossing the Chasm, Marketing and Selling High-Tech Products to Mainstream Customers. This book was originally written for startups, but the way I found out about this book was that one of my coworkers was familiar with my passion for evangelizing Haskell, and he saw the connection to the book. So he recommended the book to me. And when I read through it, the book helped crystallize a lot of what I had learned in the course of doing Haskell evangelism and also taught me several new things as well. So the goal of this talk is to translate the advice in the book to be more relevant for Haskell programmers, or more generally, to be more relevant for people trying to promote new open source technology. This will be my one hot take for the talk. Um, I would like to assert that if you're watching this talk, especially if you're a Haskell developer, there's a very high likelihood that you don't know how to market to mainstream programmers. And that's just because you are a Haskell programmer. That's if there's due to a selection bias in the community. In fact, I'll wager that many people watching this will harbor many misunderstandings about marketing. And my hope is to clear up those misunderstandings in the next few slides. I'm gonna use a few concrete examples and I'll use MongoDB as the villain in the upcoming examples with apologies to MongoDB. So the first misconception I would like to illustrate is the belief that marketing is about misleading claims. So some people believe that marketing is just about deceiving people or exaggerating a little bit. So for example, we might suppose that some developer is contemplating, hmm, which database should I select for my business? And along comes another developer who says, I recommend you use MongoDB, the only database that is web scale, whatever that means. And so people who believe that marketing is about deception will think to themselves, oh, I will steer conversations away from Haskell's poor ID support. Or more generally, they'll try to um, um, oh, exaggerate Haskell's strengths and underplay Haskell's weaknesses. And I call this a misconception because I believe that's not a good thing to do. In fact, I believe it is actually counterproductive. We as a community should be aggressively honest about Haskell's limitations and its um, downsides. And so the second misconception I would like to address is the belief that marketing is about hype. So there's a belief that the way that a technology becomes mainstream is that first it will generate some hype, which will bring in some new contributors, which will then generate more hype, which will then bring in more contributors. And then that virtuous cycle of hype will eventually take the, the technology mainstream. So for example, again, some developers contemplating to themselves, hmm, how do I know which database is the best one to use? And then some MongoDB evangelists will come along and say, oh, all the cool kids are using MongoDB, hashtag join the convo. And people who believe that marketing is just hype will then think, oh, I should just spend more time praising Haskell on social media. And that's what's gonna get that hype train rolling that will take us mainstream. And I call this a misconception because not only does this not, isn't this not helpful, it's actually harmful. It will actually it will prevent Haskell from going mainstream. And I'll talk more about why in future slides. The third misconception I would like to address is the belief that marketing is about corporate backing, some way to signal that a product has financial strength behind it. So for example, some developer might be thinking, maybe I should use Postgres. I've heard great things about it. It's open source and free. It's got a great community behind it. What's not to like? And then along comes somebody who tries to rain on their parade saying, oh, MongoDB just raised $150 million in venture capital. If you can't beat them, join them because they're doomed to succeed. And so people who think that marketing is just about a show of financial strength will think, 
that, oh, but Facebook adopting Haskell is going to save the language because now we got a big tech company providing full-time developers working on making Haskell better. Or more generally, they think that a techno new technologies need to supplicate in front of large companies to adopt them if they want to go mainstream. And I also consider this a misconception too. And because many startups, who the book was originally written for, they have financial backing and they fail to go mainstream. The vast majority of startups fail. So money is not the key bit of the equation that takes you mainstream. So if marketing is not misdeception and marketing is not hype and marketing is not corporate backing, then what is marketing? The book provides a really good definition, which I will inline here. And the definition goes like this. It says, marketing is prioritizing the needs of a market where a market is a group of users that reference each other when making decisions. And there are two things I would like to highlight from that definition. The first is the concept of prioritization. So that means that you make specific decisions not to do something, not to build some feature. So marketing is about what you choose not to build. If you try to do everything, you're not prioritizing, you're not prioritizing at all. You're just spreading yourself thin. But it's not just prioritizing needs. It's prioritizing needs of a market. So we might ask ourselves, how big is a market? Is it an individual? No, too small. Is it a company? No, too small. Is it the entire programming community? No, that's too large. So it's somewhere in between there. And a market is a group of users that reference each other. Okay, so these people, they all go to the same conferences. Um, they hire each other. Um, they all tend to hang out on the same subreddits. They will follow each other on social media. They will consult each other when making decisions. They reference each other very heavily. And this group of people is sort of like its own living being. It's got a life of its own. It's this whole that's greater than the sum of the individual people. So, and so the idea is that if you take the programming community and you break it down into these groups of self-referencing people, that's called segmentation. And when you prioritizing the needs of one of those markets, you're specifically neglecting the needs of other markets. So marketing is about who you choose not to persuade. If you combine those two principles, marketing is kind of the art of saying no, either to potential features or to potential users. And some people think that Marketing is a sleazy thing to do, but I actually firmly believe that marketing is a noble or virtuous task. And the book captures this really well in the following quote. It says, marketing's purpose, therefore, is to develop and shape something that is real and not as people sometimes wanna to believe to create illusions. In other words, we are dealing with a discipline more akin to gardening or sculpting than say to spray painting or hypnotism. So if you do good a, job, a good job of marketing, you don't need to make misleading claims, you don't need to generate artificial hype, and you don't need corporate backing. But in order to do marketing well, we need to understand some few basic principles, which brings us to the technology adoption life cycle. This is a concept that predates the book, and it was created to provide a way to talk about discontinuous changes. And you can imagine that if we were to plot all the potential adopters for technology it might look like a bell curve where people closer to the left of the bell curve are earlier adopters and people more to the right of the bell curve are later adopters. And the book actually talks about five categories. I've only plotted four. So we'll talk about early adopters and early majority the most. And we won't really talk about the late majority or the laggards. As a shorthand, I will use the term visionaries just like the book to refer to early adopters. Now we'll use the term pragmatists to refer to the early majority. Visionaries tend to prefer new technologies. Pragmatists tend to prefer proven technologies. So you'll notice in the diagram that there are little gaps in between each segment of the population. Those gaps represent places where technology adoption can pause or even outright fail. And, but one of those gaps is much larger than the others. And that it's the gap between early adopters and the early majority. And there are ways that, and so that gap is so large that the book calls it a chasm. And that's why the book is called Crossing the Chasm, because it's, it's trying to help people cross the divide between early adopters and the early majority. And the way you know that you're stuck in the chasm is 
First, there will be an initial burst of enthusiasm and adoption for your technology. And then for some inexplicable reason, adoption will decelerate. It even feels like you've hit a wall unexpectedly, which seems confusing because you would think, you know, maybe strength would build upon strength and then you just keep eventually getting adopted more and more until you get mainstream. But that's not what happens. The second thing you will notice is that visionaries adore you, but pragmatists are suspicious on the best days. On the worst days, they may be outright malicious and treat your new technology as the butt end of a joke. Another important sign is that nothing important ever officially supports you. For example, uh, AWS will release language bindings for their platform. For example, they might create officially supported bindings for C++ or Java, maybe for Go, I didn't check. Um, but they definitely didn't create it for Haskell. There's no official AWS binding for Haskell. So instead, the Haskell community has to pay its own way. We have to create our own binding to AWS, like Amazonka. So that's what it means when we say that nothing important ever officially supports you. And this is something that a lot of people already understood for quite a long time. In fact, Simon Payne and Jones understood this when he gave a talk called A Taste of Haskell, where he described the gro growth trajectories of several, um, several representative languages. So in the first slide, we show what a successful research language looks like. It grows a little bit, and then it fizzles out. And that's fine, because the, you know, the point of a research language is to be a vehicle for research. It doesn't have to go mainstream. And then on the other extreme of the spectrum, we have a language which just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing, like a mainstream language. So for example, C++ or Java. And at some point, it crosses some threshold of, immor of immortality, and it joins the pantheon of immortal languages that everybody acknowledges are mainstream. And Simon Payne Jones uses the term, the complete absence of death to describe these languages, because he has such a way with words. So where does Haskell fit in between these two extremes? Well, that brings us to this third slide right here. And this is exactly the growth trajectory you would expect for a language that is stuck in the chasm an initial burst of adoption, and then it plateaus. And then as it eventually picks up in the mainstream, it will grow again. Now, this talk was given about at least, at, at least 10 years ago. And at the time, he hypothesized that maybe Haskell was starting to break out into the mainstream. Um, but I would firmly contend that Haskell has not yet reached mainstream status and it's still stuck in the chasm. So why does this chasm exist between or um, visionaries and pragmatists. Well, the fundamental problem is that visionaries are negative references for pragmatists. And by that we mean that a visionary, when a visionary evangelizes a new technology, it will actually turn off pragmatists from that technology. And why is that? That would seem odd, right? You would think, you know, here us Haskell programmers are trying to exude positive vibes. We're not trying to be mean or turn anybody off, and yet, Somehow, we're, we're just making them more and more unhappy with us. Well, the fundamental reason is because visionaries and pragmatists have diametrically opposed values. Okay, again, it's not like an extreme, right? There's not like a hard cutoff between visionaries and pragmatists. Um, but let's talk about the values that tend to be associated with each of these two classes of people. So in the next few slides, I'm going to have large walls of text. You don't need to read the whole wall of text. I'm only going to quote the parts highlighted in bold. Um, if you'd like to read the full text later, I will share my slides and there'll also be a link on the last slide. Uh, in, uh, so for people viewing the recording, they can get the, the link as well. All right, so back to the slides. Uh, the first difference between visionaries and pragmatists is that visionaries have a lack of respect for the value of their colleagues' experiences. And the book puts it like this. Visionaries do not expect to be buying a well-tested product with an extensive list of industry references. Instead, if such a reference base exists, it may actually turn them off, indicating that for this technology at any rate, they are already too late. Pragmatists, on the other hand, deeply value the experience of their colleagues. And this is a perfect example of why their values are diametrically opposed. So for technology, the fewer references something has the more visionaries like it, because they think to themselves, oh, I got in on the ground floor for this new technology. For pragmatists, it's the opposite. The more references a technology it has, the more they like it. But that's not the only difference between them. Here's another. Visionaries take a greater interest in technology than in their own industry. 
and the book puts it like this. Visionaries are bored with the mundane details of their own industries. They like to talk and think high tech. Pragmatists, on the other hand, don't put a lot of stake in futuristic things. And if you didn't know that this book was written about startups, you think, gosh, that is a perfect description of the differences between you know, the stereotypical Haskell programmer and the stereotypical, say, Go programmer. You got the Haskell programmer who is you know, the architecture astronaut, wants to talk about you know, profunctor optics. And on the other hand, you got your stereotypical Go programmer who's like, I can write a web server in any language. What's the point of learning something new like Haskell? But uh, the differences keep uh, going. This is not the only difference between visionaries and pragmatists. For example, visionaries fail to recognize the importance of existing product infrastructure. They do not expect to find components for these systems lying around. Whereas pragmatists, when they see visionaries going their own route, they shudder. Okay, so pragmatists want everything to be ready to go out of the box. They don't want to do it themselves. And the final difference is that visionaries are just overall disruptive people. They're, they create a lot of work for themselves, for their coworkers, for their company, for their industry. They are the kind of people who like to rock the boat. As the book puts it, from a pragmatist point of view, visionaries are the people who come in and soak up all the budget for their projects. If the project is a success, they take all the credit, while a pragmatist gets stuck trying to maintain a system that is so state-of-the-art, no one is quite sure how to keep it working. Pragmatists, on the other hand, tend to be committed long-term to their profession and the company at which they work. They are very cautious about grandiose schemes because they know they will have to live with the results. All right, so suppose you believe me that visionaries and, and pragmatists have diametrically opposed values. How can we overcome that? After all, we just said that the more we visionaries evangelize into new technology, the worse that makes things get. And so you might think, okay, if I can't evangelize something, maybe I'll just make it so good that if I build it, they will come. But the problem is that it can be really hard to build something that good. We certainly don't want to sell out to some VC funded startup or to some you know, consulting company and give them too large of a stake in our ecosystem and too much influence. We don't wanna burn out working late nights and weekends trying to make pragmatists happy, especially when they don't even like us. Why are we gonna spend all our times trying to please people who hate us? Well, I don't think we actually, I don't think we need to sell out and I don't think we need to burn out. Uh, we don't need to work harder, but we do need to work smarter. And in order to do that, we need to understand what is the fundamental difference between pragmatists and visionaries. And the fundamental difference is that visionaries are project oriented and pragmatists are market oriented. And what that means is that when a visionary evaluates a new tool, they ask themselves, is this tool the best choice for the specific project that I'm working on? For example, they ask, is this the right tool for the job? And if they move to a new project, they'll reevaluate their tools. And for many people listening to this, you'll think to themselves, well, of course that's the way you evaluate tools. Is there any other way to do it? But it turns out that there is, because pragmatists think in a different way. Pragmatists, when they evaluate a new tool, they ask themselves, is this tool the best one for my industry? They tend to be very herd oriented, partly because they're risk averse, and partly because they want to take advantage of economies of scale for their entire industry adopting a tool. So if we want to get through to pragmatists, we need to start thinking, speaking, and building in a market-oriented way in order to persuade them. That's why the discipline is called marketing. So we need to stop focusing on individual people's needs and start focusing on the needs of markets, these groups of self-referencing users. And one of the reasons that we want to persuade pragmatists, despite the fact that they can be so standoffish at first, is because they may be hard to win over, but when you do, they become your greatest ally. In fact, they will actually be greater allies than the early adopters. The book has this great quote, the only thing we need to do is replace the word startup with new technology. And the quote goes like this, once a new technology has earned its spurs with the pragmatist buyers within a given market, they tend to be very loyal to it, and they even go out of their way to help it succeed. In fact, they will actually defend a technology fiercely against competitors once they've embraced it. 
And the reason why is because pragmatists are market oriented. When they, they adopt a tool, they're not adopting it on behalf of themselves. They feel like they're adopting it on behalf of their industry. So they have this very strong desire to make any new tool that they adopt official or standard for their industry. And they will try to protect its status as the official or standard tool once they adopt it. All right, so suppose that I've persuaded you that you want to convince pragmatists to adopt your tool. We still don't know how to do that. And because we've already identified kind of a chicken and egg problem, pragmatists are risk averse and they want references. As the book puts it, how can you accumulate the number of references a pragmatist requires when virtually everyone left to call on is also pragmatist? It's like a chicken and egg problem. You know, how do you get kickstart that cycle of positive references? Well, it turns out there is a recipe for breaking that, for generating that cycle of positive references. I'll call it the recipe for success. It's an oversimplification of what's in the book, but I think it's an okay distillation. So the first step is that we need to solve an enormous problem. And the problem has to be so bad that a few pragmatists have to use your tool. Because remember, pragmatists are risk averse and they're not going to use a tool without references unless they absolutely have to. So for example, I, the pragmatists will think to themselves, you know, I'd rather not try something new, but I have to use a Haskell in anger. But it's not enough to force them to use your tool. You can get a couple of them to do that, but after that experience, they will not necessarily refer your tool to their pragmatist colleagues. So that leads us to the second step, which is that you have to provide a best in class experience. It's not enough to be good, you have to be the best for that market. You don't need to be the best for the entire programming community because everybody in the programming community has different needs and that's basically impossible. But at least for the industry that that pragmatist care about, you have to be the best. So when those few pragmatists are forced to try Haskell, they need to walk away from that thinking to themselves, wow, Haskell is way better than I thought. It blows away the competition. Now that's easier said than done, right? You know, if we, if we could make, build something like that, wouldn't we have done it already? Actually, I would say that a lot of people don't know how to do that. And so the first step along the way to being able to build a best in class tool is to focus your effort on one market at a time, because there's no way you can build a top notch experience otherwise. And that means that doing so may lead to neglecting other industries. But pragmatists will not fault you for that. Uh, quite the opposite. Pragmatists would actually prefer if you tell them Haskell is not good for X. And, and, because if you tell them Haskell is OK for X and they try it and they have a bad time, then they actually turn into a negative reference. You actually would prefer that they just don't try it at all until it's ready. So pragmatists will just think to themselves, you know, Haskell may not be a good fit for other industries, but I'm okay with that. It doesn't have to be everything to everybody. So to summarize that recipe, I like to create what's called the perfect pitch, where if you can say this truthfully, then Haskell has gone mainstream. So you should be able to say, Haskell is the best tool for some industry. Everybody's saying great things about it. Ask your colleagues if you don't believe me. Notice that this pitch has absolutely no appeal to the technical merit of Haskell whatsoever. It's purely a references oriented appeal. And if you work backwards from that pitch, that will help you better understand what you need to do to make it true. And I want to really reiterate the importance of focusing on one market. And I'm gonna use an extended analogy to make that point. And so the analogy I'm gonna use is gonna be like a nuclear chain reaction. And I'm not a nuclear physicist, so I'm probably greatly oversimplifying things. But my very rough understanding is that when a nuclear reaction has you know, these various reactive particles, and if they reach a critical mass, then the reaction goes out of control. You have a chain reaction. That would be like the adoption of a tool growing uncontrollably. This is what Simon Payne Jones would call the complete absence of depth. And if the reaction is subcritical, meaning that you just don't have enough positive references to kickstart things, then eventually things, the reaction will just fizzle out. The tool adoption will slowly fade away. And this is what Simon Payne Jones calls the slow death. And people already intuitively understand this, but they try to manufacture artificial hype to stimulate the reaction. And that doesn't work because pragmatists are very hard to fool. They can see through it. 
Um, but if we understand how, if we think in terms of markets, then we can actually make it easier to kickstart such a chain reaction. So let's use this little diagram right here, where these squares, you can think of these squares as reaction chambers. And a positive reference denoted by these white circles would be like a reactive particle. Okay, and then if two positive references collide, then they will react and generate more positive references. For example, the way this might manifest is, you know, some organization will take a chance on your tool and then it works out. So then new developers are trained and then contributions are made back to the ecosystem and then standards are drafted and more positive references are created. Great, and that's, that represents the amplification of the positive reaction. Vice versa, we can have negative references, which will represent as black dots. And if a positive and negative reference collide, then maybe they fizzle out. This is an oversimplification, but you, can, you get the idea. All right, now here's the key bit where markets come in. All right, so the programming community at large is not one giant reaction chamber. Instead, you can think of each market as being its own isolated reaction chamber. That means that positive references tend to stay within their own market. Negative references also tend to, tend to stay within their own market. And this is, be, this is because we're going back to the definition of a market, where a market is a group of users that reference each other. That's why references tend to stay within their respective markets. And so we can use that fact to kickstart the chain reaction more easily. First, let's illustrate how we would not do it. So let's suppose that there were three potential markets that Haskell could you know, target to go mainstream. Maybe there's data science, and then there's finance, and then there's interpreters. And they're mostly isolated from one another. And if we do, if we just spread ourselves thin and try to do a little bit good of a job for each one of these markets, then we never kickstart a chain reaction because we never reach a critical density of positive references to trigger that amplification that we're looking for. But now suppose that we were to focus a little bit more on interpreters. And the way I'll model that is I'm just gonna move more white dots into the interpreters chamber and more black dots into the other chambers like this. And if we do that within this interpreters market, we reach a, a high enough density of positive references that we trigger a chain reaction. And at least within the interpreters market, Haskell has gone mainstream. And so when people like Google, what's the best language for doing interpreters, everything links to Haskell. Everybody's telling each other, you know, oh, you're doing an interpreter, you, you should definitely be using Haskell. Don't even consider everything else. Like all the other, other, all the other alternatives are a joke in comparison to Haskell. That's, so that's what it means to go mainstream in the interpreters market. But it does not stop there. And that's because these markets are actually not entirely isolated from one another. They do overlap a little bit. So you can imagine it looks a little bit more like this. So maybe the interpreter's market overlaps a little bit with the finance market. For example, like people need to build a domain specific language for a cryptocurrency, which is a subset of finance, let's say. And so all of a sudden those positive references from interpreters will spill over into the finance market and then they seed the positive references that pragmatists are looking for in the finance market. And so you kickstart a chain reaction there is too. And then at least within the finance market, Haskell becomes a mainstream accepted language. And then maybe finance also spills into the data science market in the same way. It kickstarts a chain reaction there. And now Haskell has gone mainstream in data science too. And this is how a language goes mainstream. It doesn't do it one individual at a time. It does it one market at a time. That's why you want to start focusing on the needs of markets rather than individuals if you want to help a tool to become mainstream. And, but, okay, so suppose you believe me that we should focus on one market. It's still not obvious which one we should go after. Um, and Haskell, like many, new, like many technologies that are stuck in the chasm, the issue isn't that there are no markets to go after. The issue is rather that there are too many good choices. This is a very common dilemma for technologies that are just on the edge of going mainstream, but not quite there. For ex I'll just name a few. This is not a comprehensive list, but maybe one market we could focus on would be interpreters. So Haskell's original reason for being created was to be the standard language for researchers to communicate results in programming language theory. Maybe we should build upon that strength to you know, become mainstream for the interpreters market. Or maybe Haskell should focus on 
web development. So Michael Snoyman pioneered Haskell in this area, which remains highly active to this day. Um, and the, you know, the, the use case is that Haskell is a maintainable backend language, which has a low total cost of ownership, right? That sounds like a very mainstream thing to say. Or maybe the thing that takes Haskell mainstream would be data science, like the purely functional language, which is great for data transformations. It's got um, types, which can help promote data quality. There was even a data Haskell group created for this purpose to help Haskell, be, Haskell become a better language for data science. Or maybe the thing that takes Haskell mainstream is finance and cryptocurrency. After all, people who have been hunting for Haskell jobs probably know that this has been one of the largest sources of jobs historically for the community. And maybe we should just follow the money to go mainstream. So how do we pick between these markets to, to focus on? Well, the book actually provides a really detailed explanation of how to do this, which I'm greatly oversimplifying. Um, but I will give the summarized version. So there are three things that we can focus on that make a good candidate for a beachhead mar mainstream market. The first thing we would like to see is what the book calls a target customer, meaning that there needs to be a single identifiable person, lead, or manager within a software engineering organization with the technical authority to adopt our tool on behalf of the rest of the organization. For example, if we were going after the data science market, then the per, the, that individual within the company would be possibly the chief data scientist. And the reason you need that individual is twofold. First, you need somebody within the company who will champion your technology to other people within the company. Second thing is, second reason why is that if you're going to build a polished best in class experience, you need to have a specific persona in mind that you're building towards. Otherwise, you're going to spread yourself thin trying to build for everybody. Okay, so the second thing that makes a good starting market is a compelling reason to adopt. Remember that pragmatists are not going to take a chance on your tool unless they have to. If they can live with the problem for one more year, they will <laughs> because they're risk averse. And then the third thing that we're looking for in a good candidate market is the whole product. And to explain what the whole product means, so for Haskell, the language, you know, the Haskell compiler, GHC, that's the minimal product, right? And maybe, the, and maybe whatever related packages that you need for that specific industry. The whole product is things like the tooling, the ecosystem, the documentation, the books, the jobs, the mind share, the stack overflow questions and answers, that's the whole product. And so you need to be close to being the best in class whole product for that specific market. If you're not close, you're, you should probably focus on another market. The good news though, is that like, it's very likely that there is at least one market out there where you're pretty close to building a best in class solution. Usually the whole reason why a technology is stuck in the chasm is because people see the potential and they see it's almost there for something. And you just got to figure out what that something is and take it all the way. So if I were to evaluate those markets on these three criteria, what would I pick? And I've kind of hinted at this throughout the talk. I think that Haskell as a community should focus on interpreters. And I'll explain why in terms of those three criteria. So first off, who is our target customer? Um, many companies like to want to have some sort of a programmable DSL for using their product. Um, and usually they will have a one person team tasked with building such a DSL. And this person will very often be way out of their league when doing so. So the important thing is though, because it's a one person team, this person has the authority to use whatever tool or language they want. If they go to their boss and say, I think we use, you should use Haskell to build the language interface or product, the boss will say, sure, whatever you want, just get me something that works in one or two weeks. They don't have to convince anybody else. All right, second thing, that I think reason, second reason why I think interpreters would make a good market is because we have the compelling reason to adopt. Usually when this one person is tasked with this task, they'll think I am way over my head. You know what, I'm just going to do a half-baked solution as like a JSON or YAML DSL. And usually the customers complain, they hate this. If you, for example, if you've ever used something like cloud formation templates, you'll ever, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. So people want an actual real programming language, not some JSON or YAML DSL. That's the, the tire fire that our industry is trying to put out right now. And so the third reason I think this is a good uh, market to adopt 
is because the Haskell ecosystem is very close to being best in class. It already has a really good reputation in this area. And there are only a few more things we need to be the total package for a user. So why not the other markets? For example, why not focus on, say, web development? And the issue with web development is that we don't have the compelling reason to adopt. Yes, there are issues with existing web development stacks. Yes, Haskell would be an improvement, but people can live with the problems right now. So nobody's gonna break from the herd to give Haskell a try. At least the pragmatists won't. You know, early adopters might, but the pragmatists will just wait and see for what other pragmatists do. So what about data science? And so the main issue with data science is the whole product. So when I think best in class for data science, I think Python. I don't know if I'm right, but maybe people disagree with me. That's what I think of. Um, regardless of whether or not Python is the best though, Haskell is very far from building an ecosystem that can be competitive with Python, let alone beat it. And moreover, um, we're gonna be fighting uphill the whole way. If you'll remember, pragmatists, once they embrace a technology, they want to make it official and standard, and they will defend it against competitors. So pragmatists will do everything they can to preserve Python's dominance in the data science ecosystem against you know, new technologies like Haskell. So it's going to make it very challenging for Haskell to ever catch up with Python. And what if we were to focus on finance or cryptocurrency? Uh, truthfully, I didn't even know if this was a good market or not. Maybe this could have also been the selection, but I'm not informed at all on this area, so I can't really speak with authority. Maybe somebody who does know more about this could you know, better educate me. So I, I didn't you know, speak one way or another about that. So now suppose you believe me that we should be focusing on interpreters, what would be the next steps? What is the whole product for that? So the first thing we should do is we should document and polish interpreter related packages. So for example, when I think of an interpreter package, obviously parsing, type checking, substitution, those are pretty straightforward. Um, another thing that's very commonly associated with interpreters are effect systems. So polishing existing effect libraries will help a lot in that regard too. Optics, so like lens, for example, they also commonly come up in the context of interpreters because interpreters tend to work with really deeply nested abstract syntax trees. So we don't need to polish the entire ecosystem. Just focusing on these packages would give us a lot of leverage for the work that we put in. The second thing that we need to focus on would be a language server that is easy to install and set up. In fact, this isn't even specific to interpreters. Like for any market, I, this would be one of the bullet points in the list. Um, for any programming language, good tooling, especially IDE support specifically, is considered table stakes for a language going mainstream. It's always an important component of the whole product because it's a very uh, immediate impact, it has a very immediate impact on the user experience. And, there, and for something to be best in class, there can't be any warts or rough edges for the things that they directly interact with. So the next thing though that we should focus on is we should have an easy to fork GitHub repository implementing an interpreted language possibly with type inference, but definitely with best practices, meaning it should be very opinionated. You should have an opinionated project layout, an opinionated choice of an effect system, an opinionated choice of maybe an optics library if it uses that. Um, make as many decisions for the user as possible. Think of this as like, you want it to be the Ruby on Rails of building an interpreter. You want somebody with no background in programming language theory to just come along and be able to pick it up, insert their little customizations that they need for their company, and they've got something working. So that's what you want. Uh, another thing that would help, maybe not strictly necessary, it would be nice if there were also an authoritative book on how to use Haskell to build an interpreter. Um, in particular, it would be great if the repository that I mentioned just above was a companion to the book. So I think if we had all those four things, then Haskell would go mainstream very quickly and then the pragmatists would kick in and they would try to preserve Haskell as the premier tool for doing interpreter related work. Now, I wanna conclude my talk with a few caveats because I wanna make sure that what I'm recommending doesn't rub people the wrong way. The first thing I would like to clarify is I don't mean to suggest that all other work is useless. In other words, if you're doing something that doesn't take Haskell mainstream, that's fine. I don't consider that to be useless work at all. I also strongly believe 
that volunteers can do whatever they want with their time. This, the advice that I'm giving is primarily for people who have the time and the inclination to help Haskell go mainstream. If that does not describe you, that's fine. I could also be wrong. So my viewpoint, especially my recommendation of interpreters, that's biased by my, my own experiences as both a professional Haskell developer and also as an open source Haskell developer. Maybe from where you stand within the industry, you see a very different picture of what can help Haskell go mainstream. And so take that suggestion with a grain of salt. And finally, I want to reiterate that going mainstream is not the be all and end all for Haskell. I, I think I speak for all of us. And I, I, I don't know who first said this, but we Haskell programmers avoid uh, a success at all costs. So it's good to be conscientious of what will help get us mainstream, but you know, just in moderation, okay? You don't actually need to be, you know, obsessive about it. Just, it, just knowing things about like focusing on markets, that goes a very long way. So uh, again, don't focus too much on my specific suggestion about interpreters. Really, I think the thing that you should take away from this talk is to start thinking in a market oriented way. Focus on the needs of markets rather than focusing on the needs of individuals. And I can't force people to work on any given market and I have no inclination to do so. But I do hope that for those people who would like to help Haskell go mainstream, this will help them achieve more with less work. Uh, if this talk interested you, I highly recommend you read the book, Crossing the Chasm. And also, if you would like to revisit this talk afterwards, here's a link to the slides in case you want to take a look at them. I'll also post them in the Slack for this conference. And yeah, I think that concludes my, th my talk. And I think the next step is we move to the Q&A Zoom room. Thank you, Gabriel, for that great talk.